you deal with nutrition. Really, when you begin to consider nutrition, we're looking at what are the components of a healthy diet. And we need a healthy diet because there are nutrients and things that are incorporated in your diet that help to fuel the physical activity and exercise that are essential towards overall improved health. So I'd like to just start out by taking a look at what these essential nutrients, what they are, and really what a diet should be comprised of. So essential nutrient is a nutrient that must be consumed. We have no biochemical mechanism, no biochemical mechanism in our cells that allow us to produce essential nutrients. Uh, so in other words, we cannot manufacture essential nutrients on our own. And they're going to include things like macronutrients. Classically include protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Also included in the essential nutrients are going to be many of our micronutrients, which include vitamins, minerals, and water. Now, as we begin to look at these macronutrients and these micronutrients, in particular, the macronutrients can be measured and quantified for their caloric, the, the amount of calories that they hold, caloric composition. And the kilocalorie is actually what we use to measure a foodstuff's energy content. What you're looking at here is the device or a picture of the device that's used to look at the caloric content or the energy content of a foodstuff. So you can see we have the sealed chamber that uh, contains a known volume of water. We've got a stirrer in there that helps to mix this water and then a thermometer that is uh, embedded in the water so we can uh, view changes in temperature. Now within that sealed container is another sealed container and this is where you put your sample. This could be a Dorito or it could be a hamburger, uh, whatever, whatever the food stuff is. We load it up with oxygen, maintain oxygen in there, and then we give that food source or that food stuff uh, an electrical current. And it's that electrical current that causes the food stuff to interact with the oxygen that's in that environment. And as that reaction occurs, it's going to give off heat. And that heat permeates through the inner container into that water and changes the temperature. And you're measuring a kilocalorie as you do this because the kilocalorie is actually a measure of the amount of heat that is produced. And the heat is analogous to the energy content. Now, by classic definition, if we increase temperature on this thermometer of one liter of water, which is the volume of water in the container, by one degree centigrade, that is the equivalent to one kilocalorie. Now in the food world, that one kilocalorie is a food calorie with a capital C. And you've probably heard this before. And the food calorie content of fat, protein, and carbohydrate can be calculated. For fat, you have nine capital C calories per gram of fat. In protein, have four calories per gram of protein, and then in our carbohydrates or our sugars, a 
another four calories per gram found here. So the energy content of the food is actually what your body is looking to utilize from fats, proteins, and carbohydrate to uh, provide energy to all of the metabolic and biochemical reactions that occur inside of the cell and maintain the individual's overall uh, function, overall living capabilities. Now, before we go on and take a look at the required intake for proteins, fats, and carbohydrates and begin to uh, take a look at how we calculate the amount of uh, caloric intake that an individual needs, we want to take a look at the standard American diet. This figure here shows you the leading sources of calories that are current, uh, currently consumed in the American diet. So you can see that a lot of these things are going to be calorie sources that you would say, ooh, that's probably not a very healthy food. I'll key you into a couple of them. Number four here, pizza, 3.1% of the American diet. The calories are coming from pizza. And number nine, 2.6% of the American diet comes from calories consumed in beer. So overall, you would say, wow, the American diet, the average American diet, appears to be pretty unhealthy. And the simple fact of the matter is, is this has been the American diet for a very long time. This has been the American diet prior to the obesity epidemic that began in the 60s and the 70s. The major thing that's happened here is we deviated away from a higher amount of physical activity as many more of our jobs have become mechanized and we spend more time sitting at our desks. So the American diet really, even though it's a source of calories, hasn't changed all that much. It may have very little to do with overall health other than to supply the required nutrients for maintaining the cells and maintaining cellular function. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a look at our individual macronutrients. We're going to start here with protein. Here's an example of where you can get uh, protein from. Proteins are going to be basic building blocks for cellular material. Proteins are made up of a compound called amino acids. And they can be organized into long chains of molecules that contain car carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And organized into long chains of amino acids to provide structural and functional components you find in our individual cells. Now when we look at dietary protein intake, there are two sources of these amino acids that we find in these proteins. There's a complete source when you consume a complete protein source, this is a food stuff that supplies all of your essential amino acids. And this is going to include primarily meats and animal products. However, you could combine things like beans and rice or beans and another uh, vegetable-based or legume-based food to create a complete protein source. Now alongside the uh, complete source, the essential amino acid is a, an amino acid that cannot be produced in the organism, within the body. So if we get all of the essential amino acids that we cannot produce on our own from, own from a protein source, it's a complete protein source. The second source is an incomplete protein source. And the incomplete uh, uh, protein source is a 
a source of protein or a food stuff that supplies most, but not all, of the essential amino acids. And primarily our incomplete sources are going to be plant-based foods. So what is the recommendation for normal daily intake of protein? The recommended intake for most people is going to be about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass. So 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass. And this ends up being roughly 10 to 35 percent of the total daily caloric intake. Now most of us do not utilize proteins as a heavy energy supply, so we're not really losing the proteins the same way that we lose uh, carbohydrates in particular, but also our fats. And so higher levels of protein intake, higher than 35%, is actually not going to have any additional benefit to the organism. So about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is all that you really need. We don't really need to be supplementing our diets with protein shakes and uh, other protein sources. That's going to add no additional value to the diet. It's just going to create expensive urine. Uh, the second macronutrient are the fats. And we can also call the fats lipids. So lipids and fats, these are synonymous terms. Now, the fats are going to be very important in our energy supply. So fats supply energy. Uh, in addition to supplying energy, fats also help to insulate and support and cushion our organs. And going back to the body composition lecture, you remember that we had uh, some essential fat that needed to be incorporated. And this is where that essential fat ends up, is to insulate and to support and provide cushion for many of our organs. Fats also are going to be the conduit for absorption of lipid-soluble vitamins that you consume with your diet. Above and beyond these critical uh, critical attributes of fat, fat also is a very important flavorizer in food. And when we get down to fats from a chemical perspective, how the chemical structure is for a fat is going to determine how that fat functions and what it does inside of our cells. So chemical structure for fat is very important. And you probably run into different chemical structures before. One of them that you all should recognize is saturated fats. This is a reference to the chemical structure of the fat. The saturated fat is in a big long chain. So we have this long chain, and this long chain has uh, hydrogens, with carbon right here in the middle, and hydrogens at the very end. So this is a basic structure of the fat. Now when a fat is saturated, what you'll see is that each of the carbons here in the middle has four bonding partners. Okay, So we have four bonding partners, and that means that there's no double bonds. Carbons always have to have four uh, bonding partners unless they bond to uh, uh, another fellow carbon. We could get rid of this hydrogen right here and allow these two carbons to bind up in a double bond. Now, when you have no carbon-carbon double bonds, it's said that that molecule is totally saturated. So we get rid of that bond there, and we have four bonding partners on each of our carbons, and that means there's no double bonds, and so that particular fat is considered to be saturated. There's no additional hydrogens or bonding partners that can be incorporated into this molecule. 
Now, these molecules that have no double bonds, they end up being solids at room temperature. And you're all familiar with uh, saturated fats that end up being solids. Things like lard and butter are examples of saturated fats. A second compositional uh, structure that we have, or chemical composition that we may have, is a monounsaturated. So a monounsaturated fat. Now, the monounsaturated, the mono refers to one. And so we're going to have a single carbon-carbon double bond. So a single carbon-carbon double bond. And what happens is where that double bond occurs, we actually get a kink in that chain. And this creates a much larger area that that fat molecule can consume. Whereas up here, it's a much smaller area. So this, the overall structure for this molecule up here would be much more linear. And it would be a much smaller distance from one side of the molecule to the other. Whereas here, we have a much wider distance. That means that molecules don't pack as tight together. And so these molecules have more room. And in terms of matter, Molecules with more room are going to transition from being solid at room temperature to being liquid at room temperature. The last chemical structure and composition that we may have for our fats are the polyunsaturated fats or lipids. And the poly means many, so we're going to have two or more carbon-carbon double bonds in our lipids that are polyunsaturated. And these also are going to have that much higher amount of room within the molecule, more like our monounsaturated fats. So these are going to have two kinks rather than just a single kink, and they're also going to be liquid at room temperature. Now, in addition to the lipids that we've just described, another fat that we find in our diet is a fat called cholesterol. And cholesterol is actually a very important molecule. I know that a lot of times we think of cholesterol as being bad. And high levels of cholesterol are bad. But normal levels of cholesterol are important because they end up as components of our cell membranes. So all of our cells incorporate cholesterol. And this helps to maintain the membranes of those cells for optimal function. Now, the amount of cholesterol that we find circulating in the blood, what we would call the blood levels, are actually affected by your fat intake. See, when cholesterol circulates, cholesterol is a molecule that's called hydrophobic. It doesn't really do well in heavily water-based environments. And your blood is a heavily water-based environment. And so it has to be attached to something else to make it be able to circulate in the blood. And what we attach the cholesterol to are molecules called lipoproteins. And you've heard of these before. They include things like the low-density lipoproteins. And these are proteins that bind on to cholesterol and are abbreviated LDL. And the LDL, or the low-density lipoprotein, is the protein that binds onto the cholesterol to help transport that cholesterol through the watery environment of the blood. Now, the thing about low-density lipoproteins is they have a tendency to collect on the walls of the arteries. So as we increase the levels of LDLs carrying cholesterol because we've increased our overall level of cholesterol from a high fat diet, what we begin to see is more of those LDLs collecting on the 
walls of the artery, and this has a result of decreasing the artery's diameter. And this impedes blood flow and can cause other issues. So that's going to be our low density lipoprotein or LDL. Now, cholesterol can also be transported by a high density lipoprotein. And the high density lipoprotein or the HDL is actually the molecule that's responsible to transport cholesterol out of the arteries. So LDLs transport cholesterol through the bloodstream, through the arteries. The HDLs are going to transport the cholesterol out of the arteries. And as high density lipoprotein levels increase, we actually have cholesterol that's removed from the bloodstream and we have a lower requirement or a lower need for the low density lipoproteins. So the HDLs are actually beneficial at regulating blood cholesterol levels. So you have your lipids and you have your cholesterols that are required to be consumed in the diet. So here too, what are the recommended daily amounts to intake in your diet? So for males, recommended intake is between 17 and 18 grams of fats on a daily basis. For women, for females, we're looking at 12 to 13 grams. Now these values here are 17 to 18, 12 to 13, are roughly right around the equivalent of between 3 and 4 teaspoons of oil. And from a calorie perspective, these three to four teaspoons of oil on a daily basis are roughly between 20 to 35 percent of that daily that daily caloric intake. All right, our next macronutrient, our final macronutrient, are the carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, um, you may also call them sugars or saccharides. These are an extremely important energy source. And when we look at carbohydrates, they come in two different forms, simple and complex. Now the difference between simple and complex carbohydrates, a simple carbohydrate by definition is a carbohydrate that contains one to two molecules of a sugar. So one of the most common simple carbohydrates is what we would call food sugar. Includes a molecule called sucrose, which is a glucose and a fructose molecule bound together or bonded together. The complex carbohydrates are chains of the glucose molecules all put together and include molecules like starch. Now these complex carbohydrates, before they can be utilized, they actually have to be broken down into simple carbohydrates. And those simple carbohydrates, especially the 
carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates that have two molecules are further broken down into the same molecule, into glucose. And it's that glucose that's going to be for use. And it's glucose that we utilize to produce the vast majority of our ATP that we utilize for a variety of our different tissues to supply the different tissues with adequate energy. Another carbohydrate that we will run into in our diet, we need to consume fiber. Fiber is also a carbohydrate. It's a carbohydrate that we actually do not have the ability to break down. So it's actually a complex carbohydrate that can't be broken down, doesn't ever enter into the bloodstream from the gut, remains in the gut, and helps to regulate the overall health of the digestive. And we want to consume between 25 and 38 grams of fiber on a daily basis. For our other carbohydrates, the recommended caloric intake or daily caloric intake for the other carbohydrates is roughly 130 grams. And this accounts for between 45 and 65 percent of the daily caloric intake. So I've just given you several different numbers here for our three macronutrients. So how do we put those numbers to use? How can you put those numbers to use to evaluate your need or evaluate the caloric consumption your body will require? So most scholars will agree that an average college student needs about 2,400 calories. Now, it's going to depend a little bit upon your body weight. So this would be a caloric need for a 90 kilogram individual. If you're smaller than 90 kilograms, which a lot of you probably are, you can look up the caloric need on the internet for your specific body weight. So take your body weight in kilograms, and you can get an idea of how many calories you should plan to consume on a daily basis. So here is our total caloric intake, 2,400 total calories. So to start out with, let's look at protein. So if you're 90 kilograms, you will remember that the recommended intake was 0.8 grams per kilogram. So we're just simply going to take our 90 kilograms and multiply it by our 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. And when you do the math here, this ends up being about 72 grams. Multiply that number times 4, because it's 4 calories per gram, and you end up with about 288 calories. Take that 288 compared to the 2400, and that's 12% of your total caloric intake coming from protein. We can do the same for the fat intake. Now fat intake should be roughly around 30% of the total caloric intake. So we're going to take our total caloric intake, we're going to multiply that by 30%. We're going to put 30% here in decimal form. And that gives you about 720 calories. So that's your 30%. Now if we take our 30% that we have here, 30% of the calories, calories coming from there, add in our protein, that's another 12%. That gives us a total of 42% of our 2,400 calories coming from our protein and coming from our fat. So the balance should be carbohydrates. So we're going to take our carbohydrates. We've already utilized 42 percent of our calories from the protein and from the fat. So take your 2,400 calories, multiply it by the remaining 58 percent that you have to spend, and this gives you 1,392 calories 
consumed in the form of carbohydrate. And so now you can go through and look at how many calories, how many grams, you can divide this by four, you can divide this number here by the nine calories, divide this number here by the four calories, and it's going to give you your grams of calories, or grams of uh, each of these protein, fat, and carbohydrate that you should consume in your diet. All right, the final word here for your diet is related to your macro, micro rather, I'm sorry, your micronutrient consumption. And you remember there are three different micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and water. Now, the micronutrients really do not add anything to the diet in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, calories. Vitamins are defined as organic, meaning carbon-containing compounds. Include things like vitamin A, vitamin B, the vitamin, uh, vitamin C. Vitamins are used in many of our chemical reactions that we have inside of our cells. So we want to have an adequate supply of vitamins in order to have normal, healthy chemical operation occur. The minerals, on the other hand, are considered to be inorganic, which means do not contain carbon. So we have inorganic compounds, and they include our electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium. Uh, it also includes iron and zinc and copper. And a lot of these compounds help out in the regulatory processes for the growth and tissue maintenance. Our final micronutrient is water, H2O. And water is critically important because 60% of your total body weight, 60% of the human body is comprised of water. The remaining 40% is all of the other stuff. So water is a major component of the human body. We find it inside of the cells, we find it outside of the cells. So it's very important that we maintain an adequate water supply. And this is going to be a sex-biased uh, requirement. For women, look at about nine cups per day. For men, an adequate supply is going to be 13 cups per day. So very important that you have an adequate supply of those macronutrients of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Also to maintain a good micronutrient intake, vitamins and minerals to help regulate chemical processes and maintain our tissue. And then also to supply the body with an adequate amount of water. So that's all I have. That's the end of ES 101 lectures. I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll see you in ES 102.